databases are the most important software we have. Without them, the world economy would grind to a halt. Today, they are large and complex distributed systems, but they have a humble origin, starting out as single servers or mainframe oracle databases. Then, the amount of data exploded, growing exponentially. So to store it, one server was no longer enough. We need actual scale. Or the industry cargo cult that Google and a few other companies that actually had that need. Decide for yourself. But scaling horizontally was complicated. Databases were never designed to be distributed systems. They were just incompatible with the concept, or so it seemed. For one, transactions are ordered. But it is impossible to globally order in distributed systems. Meaning we must simplify. That simplification and the needs of web scale led to the invention of NoSQL, MongoDB, Cassandra, Bigtable, removing the difficult to implement guarantees traditional databases give you. One of them being serializable multi-road transactions, which obviously make them difficult to use correctly. And if you do need multi-road transactions, the complexity is just moved into the application code. So the databases get misused and correctness bugs occur all over the place. But then, in 2012, Google revolutionized the industry, yet again, by releasing the Spanner, Google's globally distributed database, Paper. A true, horizontally scaled SQL database. Of course, the rest of the industry wouldn't catch up for another, well, almost 10 years. That's because Google could rely on two components no one else had. GPS and atomic clocks. Before we move further, you must understand why the first iteration of NoSQL removed the support for transactions. Meaning, you must understand what serializable is. So, let's say we have two rows and two transactions. The first transaction writes A and the second writes B. If they are serializable, the result appears as if the transactions ran in series. So, the only two and scenarios are both rows contain either A or B. If non-serializable transactions run in parallel, the rows could be either A or B, no matter what the other row is. So B A and A B are executions only possible on non-serializable transactions. Serializable is easy in a single server, but with multiple servers it becomes nearly impossible. That's because we run into the cap theorem. Consistency, we always read the most recent write, availability, every request gets a non-error response, and partition tolerance. The system keeps operating even if two nodes can't communicate. In a distributed database, we can only guarantee two out of the three. Most databases and protocols are designed to guarantee consistency and availability, thus not being tolerant against partitions. Not a big deal in the real world, but we must be correct in the abstract. Every kind of failure will happen. An example of such a protocol is two-phase commit, the most popular one for doing cross-server transactions. It has a coordinator for controlling the algorithm and the workers actually storing the data. First, the coordinator sends a prepare to all workers. Every worker responds with yes or no. If there are any no's, an abort message is sent to all workers to cancel. But if all workers respond with yes, the coordinator sends a commit message to them, causing the workers to actually commit the data and respond to the coordinator. Once every worker has responded, the coordinator responds that the transaction is successful. But if a worker fails or the coordinator can no longer contact one of the workers, the algorithm is stuck because the coordinator requires replies from all workers. That's the P in cap. Any failure of a worker will cause our system to grind to a halt. And in distributed systems, the only thing you can rely on is that your servers will fail cattle, not pets. We must somehow make the workers not fail even though our servers are inherently failure prone. So let's look a bit closer at this protocol. A worker is really just a simple state machine. It's either ready for a request, to which it can get a prepare message and go to prepared. From there, we may get an abort or commit, both causing us to go back to ready for request, just with different messages and operations being done in the worker. So 
how do we run a distributed and fault-tolerant state machine? Which, of course, Leslie Lamport answered way back in the 90s talking about part-time parliaments on a tiny Greek island in the middle of the Mediterranean named Paxos? The paper was so contrived, no one understood it or used it for a decade. Until Leslie got tired of being told it was complex and wrote another paper, Paxos Made Simple, which made it a staple algorithm controlling all distributed systems to this day. But explaining Paxos is a video in itself, how it goes from a free-phase leaderless protocol with super complex error handling into a leader-based protocol running on RDMA networks. So let's just say we have a distributed Paxos state machine. Now we can take our physical worker and make it a logical one running on a Paxos group instead. So a two-phase commit now just uses the Paxos groups. That's exactly how Google's banner works, with one caveat. Shockingly, that's where atomic clocks and GPS come in. To achieve ordering of transactions, a read must always happen after all committed writes. Otherwise, our later transactions might not read the data that has been committed, thus breaking the serializable constraint. To do this, each transaction gets a global commit timestamp. But the big problem, one that makes all distributed systems difficult, is time. We need a way of globally ordering events by assigning timestamps without communicating with other nodes. But every server's clock is inaccurate, which we call clock skew. What we're trying to do is the holy grail of distributed systems. It's actually an impossible problem, but we can get close by synchronizing the clocks. The easy way is using clock servers. Just have one machine periodically syncing the true time to the workers. Which doesn't work, because we must also be able to sync between data centers. It's not possible to have one data center be the correct time. It takes too long to send data in between them, causing clock skew to go. And for Spanner, clock skew is a very big factor impacting performance. Whenever we write, Spanner waits for time that we know clock skew milliseconds have passed. Then no pending reads are in between. So small clock skew is really important, meaning each data center must magically know the true time independently, but still be the same as the others. GPS works by broadcasting extremely accurate timestamps which is used to calculate the distance to the satellite. Instead of calculating the distance, we can use the time to synchronize the data centers. Add in some atomic clocks in the data center and we have another way of synchronizing. Combine the two and we get extremely low clock skew. So the spanner is basically just a bunch of Paxos groups partitioning a key range with a layer of two-phase commit on top with some atomic clocks sprinkled around. But there are also open source versions and they obviously can't rely on atomic clocks, but they still work. One example, CockroachDB, just doesn't wait before writing. Instead, they detect when reads are within the time uncertainty interval and if they are, restart the read making write performance not be affected by high clock skew. So we can allow it to be much higher. However, you do get significantly worse performance if a key is highly contentious. And that's a distributed database. But do you really need Spanner, CockroachDB, or well, any distributed database? As with all things, it's a trade-off. It's certainly going to be more complex than a single instance Postgres databases, slower and more expensive too, to make the decision, if you truly need it, the two big things to consider are reliability and scale. For reliability, remember that in each partition there is a Paxos group that works even if some server fails, without any downtime. Meaning if our application is extremely vulnerable to even the short periods of downtime that would be required to change a primary secondary setup, you might consider using a distributed database. But if you are working where a maximum of tens of minutes and probably more like tens of seconds is an existential threat to your company and you don't already have a strategy for this, there are probably far worse dangers to have a higher likelihood of failing than your database. So fix those first. As for scale, unless you have tens of terabytes of data, 
or well, like at least 10 or hundreds of thousands of transactions per second, you're probably fine with a single server. I would sooner move out any analytics use case out of the main database into a Columnar store, and frankly, most people don't even have one terabyte of data, at least of the useful kind. In conclusion, you probably do not need a distributed SQL database. But if you do, you're probably large enough that you have a team that can actually maintain it. So, good luck. That's it for the video. Thank you for watching.